So welcome everyone and thanks so much for taking the time to be with us for our first seminar of this academic year. My name is Norni Lidjon and I'm Director of the Information Law and Policy Centre, one of the academic centres based at the University of London's Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. And it is my very great pleasure and I'm delighted today to chair and introduce our distinguished panel of leading experts in law, policy making and computer science for today's very timely and topical discussion, which focuses on the future of UK data protection law post-Brexit. Our lead speaker today is Dr. David Erdos. David is co-director of the Centre for Intellectual Property and Information Law and an associate professor in law and the Open Society at the University of Cambridge Faculty of Law. He is also a WYNG Fellow in Law at Trinity Hall College, Cambridge. Before joining Cambridge in 2013, David spent six years as a research fellow at the Centre for Sociolegal Studies at the Faculty of Law and Balliol College at the University of Oxford. David's current research explores the nature of data protection, especially as it intersects with the right to privacy, freedom of expression, freedom of information and freedom of research. In addition, David continues to have a research interest in bills of rights and related constitutional developments, especially in the UK and other Westminster democracies. Following his main presentation, interventions will be provided by our three discussants, who I will introduce later on. In terms of the general format for the seminar, once our panelists have all presented, we will open up the discussion to the so-called digital floor. So please include any questions or comments you have for our panel in the chat box below. We'll try to direct and answer as many of these to our panel as possible in the remaining time. So now I would like to thank our speakers and you again for joining us here today and invite Dr. David Erdos to begin today's very topical seminar with his paper, UK Data Protection Reform in Transnational Context, What New Direction? David, whenever you're ready, thank you. Thank you very much, Nora. And it's a really great pleasure to be involved in this really topical and interesting event, albeit uh, online rather than in person, but hopefully in person, uh, these sorts of events uh, very soon. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, share my uh, screen because uh, I do have some slides and actually start the slideshow uh, as well. So as 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 uh, Nora said, this actually is a presentation based on a on a working paper, an SSRM paper, which you can find. Um, but obviously, it's a sort of truncated run through uh, that because there is an awful lot of density in these proposals. And I'm sure that is something which others are going to mention. That really, where, where, you know, how can you sensibly get through everything given the sheer uh, amount of uh, proposals which are in uh, this document? So, a document produced almost six months ago now, uh, Data A New uh, Direction, looking at how the UK might shift away from the EU scheme of data protection, but in particular from the GDPR to uh, something different. But what uh, a different? What what sort of lodestar can we grab hold of uh, in terms of thinking of metrics and thinking of um, extent of change? Well, you could look at sort of adequacy negotiations, and that is one possibility. The problem with that is that is a uh, secret in a way. It's it's all very politicized, and it's all very much uh, uh, behind closed doors often. Uh, and, 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 and very vociferous in the sense that every single country has its own negotiations. We remain a European country, I think, and so is the EU a political actor within Europe. And so I think what is a more fruitful way of looking at the extent of change is to compare it to the Council of Europe's data protection framework, the convention, uh, and actually the updated convention, which is now agreed uh, it very much follows the European pattern in a way um, and uh, will come into force in a number of years. The UK has signed it and says that it is strongly committed to it. And, and so is the EU. And I actually think that this framework, this Council of Europe framework, will become increasingly important uh, in data discussions and particularly important in the bilateral EU-UK relationship because it represents a sort of transparent and common commitment to a data protection standard. And so alongside the GDPR and alongside this, these paper proposals, I will very much concentrate on the Council of Europe's framework as another lodestar. Having said that, I'm going to do a look at this. I have to say this will very much be an overview and hopefully it will 
build towards that interesting discussion to come uh, through looking uh, at all the building blocks that the GDPR contain. So clearly we currently have the UK GDPR and the EU has the GDPR or the U EU GDPR. Unfortunately, there are quite a lot of building blocks to look at. You've got to look at the scope of data protection. You've got to look at the core principles of data protection, including the legality criteria. And then you've got to look at the detailed provisions or rules which exist for sensitive data, for transparency and control, and for the voluminous provisions on integrity uh, duties, sometimes called security or accountability. And that's even before you get to look at uh, the supervision system, which I'm going to argue is incredibly important. And we should probably be focusing in our discussions more on that than on some of the substance which is suggested. And finally, we need to remember that the GDPR itself pro provides flexibility to member states. It allows derogations, quite wide ranging derogations when it comes to the substantive rules. That's why they're in uh, green. Uh, more limited ones when it comes to the principles. So it's an incredibly complicated landscape, even before you get to wider analysis. So let's start with the areas where I, I think there's there's less uh, difference than, than, than you might think, starting with scope. So even the convention provides very little opportunity for um, scope to be, to, to, to be remodeled because both frameworks place primary reliance on processing, anything at least digitally uh, uh, orientated, personal data, any information about an identified or identifiable individual. It's true that some other jurisdictions have limited the scope of data law to things like systematic collection, organized collection of data. I think that's very interesting, but the convention doesn't allow it. It could allow it through derogations, maybe, but not through simple exclusion. So the main possible changes remain uh, very limited uh, in, in terms of looking at identifiability, uh, looking at it in terms of disproportionate effort, and look at it, looking at it in terms of relativity or objectivity. In terms of the principles, the convention also has a very similar pattern to the GDPR. Yes, there is less specificity when it comes to things like purpose compatibility. We don't have Article 6.4, the sort of open texture test of compatibility. And we don't have such a focus on the necessity of processing. It's more a standard of, of non-excessiveness. But nevertheless, there's very limited scope for change here either. And again, maybe unsurprisingly, we don't see uh, much change. We see issues to do with clarifying compatibility, clarifying legitimate interests. Now, the big elephant in the room here is what do you do with e-privacy, which technically is not part of data protection stricto sensu. It's a part of, of, of confidentiality law. Uh, and uh, yes, it has an association with the processing of personal data, but only an association. The changes here would be very dramatic. Uh, um, PECA could in theory be virtually abolished by these changes, at least in terms of uh, consent for cookies. But you get the impression that this isn't really the government's uh, understanding of what they actually want to happen. They, they talk about much more limited changes to do with data analytics and seem to spend a lot more time on that, which would be quite a minor change. Uh, and, 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 and a continuing discussion about how you get consent, I would be very surprised if the PECA changes are fundamentally implemented, but they would be far reaching. The other changes uh, would be uh, more a matter of, of, of degree. Now, as we move into the detailed rules, we get to an interesting divergence here in the sense that the convention in principle would allow for much much wider divergence. It would allow a, a system based only on appropriate safeguards for sensitive data rather than the sort of rule-based substantial public interest derogations that we see in the GDPR. And what's interestingly interesting is that the GDPR uh, proposals don't actually go anywhere near 
the extent of the changes that would theoretically be possible if we think of the convention as being a possible lodestar for agreement and adequacy, which I think is a, is a plausible suggestion, and it's the suggestion I make in my paper. Yes, there is a concern about the substantial public interest being sort of misused by the judiciary in terms of judicial activism. And so there's a concern to remove uncertainties as to the meaning of the substantial public interest. But all the other changes are implementing new processing grounds for the substantial public interest that, frankly, um, even uh, uh, the uh, member states could actually try and probably uh, probably could 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 implement because there's nothing um, incoherent with saying that you need in the substantial public interest to process health data very easily in emergency. The AI anti bias training and testing actually even is in a concrete EU pan EU proposal on AI at the moment, and democratic engagement of political parties is also manifestly in principle in the substantial public interest. So limited change here. A more complex area is transparency and control rights. It's more complex because um, the convention, again, allows some very significant divergence. I mean, we, we know that the transparency rules are voluminous in the GDPR. I think something like 17 bits of information need to be provided uh, in the case of any direct collection in theory. And there's a, a, a detailed code as to what you do even when it's from the public domain or from a third party. The convention has a much lighter structure uh, with more possibility of absolute exceptions when it comes to public domain data or even third party data. Now, again, a bit like sensitive data, the uh, proposals don't make use of that potentially wide new uh, derogation territory. Uh, they make no changes when it comes to privacy notices or data protection notices, aside from this slight thing to do with research repurposing. Do you need to go back to the data subject if you're repurposing for a research purpose? But note that even the GDPR would allow that because of the case-by-case -case restrictions clause. However, in the two areas where they do get their teeth into change, it shows the difficulty of doing this even within the convention framework. So the proposals for a fee in all circumstances for subject access and for a cost limit, which is an absolute cost limit in all circumstance, are difficult to square even with the way the subject access right is framed, even in the convention. And then the proposal to get rid of all artificial intelligence uh, extra rights when decision making has been made on a purely automated basis, again, sits uneasily even with the convention because the convention itself includes specific rights in this area. And maybe that shows how tricky it is to um, come up with a law that is compatible with a transnational framework in every way. Or maybe it also shows that in certain areas, possibly areas that corporations really care about, or maybe elements of the Conservative Party, the proposals really are quite radical. I've already mentioned e-privacy and cookies, uh, the proposal being very radical if it was implemented, and AI would be the other one, substantively. But otherwise, the basic framework is quite limited change uh, in, in terms of, of, of comparing to the, to, the, uh, uh, to the GDPR. The big changes actually are suggested in relation to integrity duties. So in relation to subsidiary provisions, which are designed you know, in a way to uh, uh, um, enable compliance, but not as values in and of themselves. And we know that the GDPR maybe infamously does contain an awful lot of provisions in this area. I mean, that first diagram I put up showing the long list, there were things I excluded, I think, from that list because there just wasn't the space to put them on. It is a complex and prescriptive scheme. And there is a vast gap between that and the high level accountability framework that the convention requires. And it does seem that the UK has grabbed hold of quite a lot of that to suggest changes. So we might see the end of impact assessments, prior consultation, specific documentation duties, statutory data protection officer requirements. 
and the replacement of them by a privacy management program duty, which is rather high level accountability stuff. Uh, and there's similar things around data transfers and to some extent breach notification. It's, it's similar territory. Now, is this significant change? Yes, from the GDPR it is. From the perspective of the convention, most of the provisions are in principle within the convention. You can't really say, I can find you the provision in the convention that is not in compliance. But there is a, um, a suggestion in the convention, or it's a, a late motif throughout the convention, that it is risk-based and that you increase responsibility in high-risk situations. And there must be a concern that this sort of abolition across the board will make um, implementation even of the convention and that sort of data protection framework very difficult, uh, which isn't to say that some of the proposals on getting rid of some of the complexity and prescription, particularly of low-level processing, um, wouldn't be uh, as sensible here. The last area, as I say, I want to get to, which I think is very important, is data protection supervision. Now, obviously, you know, the GDPR promised so much. It promised eye-watering fines, and it promised, if, at least if you read some of the recitals, uh, virtually an obligation on uh, data protection authorities to systematically enforce any significant infringement of the rules. Um, now, the, the convention is much looser than that, but there's still a very strong focus on having a data protection authority who's committed to upholding data subject rights, who is really, in a way, a champion for data subjects. And there are concerns here in terms of what the, 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 the government are proposing. The, the, the ICO already, and in a way the background is that the ICO already has been pulling away from being that kind of champion, pulling away from being a systematic enforcer to being more of an enforcer when they want to be or, or when they think that it is a deserving case, not, not a, an objective test of significance, but really uh, being selective uh, in what they target uh, and increasingly stressing data protection's conflict with other values. Now, the um, government's proposals would juridify this. They would say that the ICO must, alongside data protection, look at growth, innovation, competition, public safety. They place a huge potential role on the government itself to uh, ensure that that is the case and that, in their view, the DPA isn't going awry um, in terms of its codes of practice, in terms of its guidance, in terms of its priorities. And they want to place de jure limits on the extent to which data subjects can raise complaints. Now, Alongside that, they, be, they want to beef up the powers of the ICO and give it greater status and stature through establishment of a board. But nevertheless, I think the clear thrust is to support the ICO's change of tack, to uh, support the notion that it should be as much about innovation as it should be about protection. And given where we're at and given how little enforcement is actually going on at the hard end and how much systematic and serious illegality is going on, I think actually this is probably one of the most um, troubling uh, aspects of the reform. And I would say a reform which is not fully compatible with the convention because it expects a, an authority with, with clear powers to be a champion upholder of data protection. So where are we then? What are the conclusions? And I, I, this is very much a, a a prequel to more detailed discussion. At the purely substantive level, most of the changes, I know this might be controversial, but I think most of the changes are evolutionary rather than revolutionary. Um, now, the two exceptions, I think, are the pecker things, which I'm almost treating that as not strict, you know, in strict sense, part of data protection, uh, but then the AI provisions, but otherwise they're largely evolutionary. Some of them are even sensible. Um, and I would include some of the integrity changes there. But, but and the, the concerns begin at that point because the whole overall package is so tilted towards controllers. Where are we talking about some additional substance, some additional protection, some additional rights, which, which respond not to the 
legitimate concerns of controllers, they exist, but the legitimate controllers of data subjects, that it's completely absent. But my biggest concern is the entrenchment, potential entrenchment and acceleration of the ICO away from being an upholder and champion of data protection. Now, maybe the ICO with a new information commissioner is open to rethink. I'm not, I'm not, I'm going, not going to hold my breath on that. Um, but nevertheless, with legislative changes in a way juridifying that, this could mean that we really, for the long term, don't have a strong data protection champion. Um, and I think that that's a shame because I think that one could tell a story about leaving the EU and having new flexibility in data protection, which, yes, was about get stripping away some of the complexity some of the bureaucracy, some of the substance, which is frankly sometimes unbalanced. But combining that almost as the other side of the coin with genuine, proper, in systematic enforcement uh, to deliver a result for data subjects. Because I think that if you go out and you talk to average data subjects, such as maybe we don't do very much, and I would hold myself up, in in that way, you probably find that most people don't think data protection is very effective or, or or means something. So surely a reform should start with trying to address that and making data protection real for people, and that really would be a benefit of Brexit if that was possible. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, David, for a impressively detailed and insightful and, and very thought provoking paper, particularly on EU data protection law and how it intersects, especially with the Council of Europe modernized convention 108 on data protection. I thought the comparative analysis that you did was was fascinating. I do. I'm going to take advantage of my position as chair to just um, raise some comments for consideration, because I do think um, there's some fantastic interventions to be provided shortly by our panelists. But I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts later, should we have time, on the fact that the current direction of travel under, shall we call it, the UK data protection acqui, is that we may not have what is recognized as an independent data protection supervisory authority in line with what has been, well, first of all, said in the DCMS consultation paper, which as we all know, these are proposals. These aren't concrete, they're proposals, but they are certainly testing the waters as you raised in your presentation as to having a data protection authority that doesn't act with complete independence, which we know is a cornerstone of EU data protection law both in the legislation, the GDPR, in the case law of the court. It's very settled case law now. And I think quite significantly, speaking to your paper, David, it is an explicit requirement under the modernized Convention 108, under Article 15, that there should be data protection supervisory authorities that do act with complete independence. So there's already divergence there between the proposals put forward and also, and there's been a lot of debate as to what these actually mean. Some would argue that the data protection regulations that came in post-Brexit in 2019, when they removed the reference to an independent data protection authority from the current legislation with the substitution of the commissioner, that that was just, that was just language, you know, that had nothing to do with substantive change. But then we had the DCMS consultation paper, which again, you know, it's testing those waters, indicating a change towards something that's very much departing from what we know is one of the core safeguards under UK data protection or independent data, data protection supervision. So just one point, one point for your consideration for later. And then I wanted to pick up, too, on the point that you made where you distinguish PECR or the e-privacy directive from EU data protection law. So I wonder if you could maybe expand more on that later in terms of the Lex, the Lex Generalis and the Lex Specialis relationship that they do have, them being so closely intertwined. And I'm thinking as well today of the, uh, the decision of the Belgian Data Protection Authority regarding consent. <laughs> Shall I just say a couple of things on that now, or, or did you want to push ahead? Um, yes, 
go ahead and then we'll very swiftly push on with the interventions. Thank you very much. Yeah, Dick. yeah. I, mean, I, I think that the whole issue of whether sort of um, Brexit uh, regulations are technical measures and obviously are meant to be technical measures or whether they could have substantive effects is interesting. I mean, I think that, you know, for example, the necessity test when it comes to freedom of expression um, has been deleted. And so presumably that is, and it just says, you know, uh, uh, the exemptions are such as are in legislation. And in a way, what you're painting when it comes to DPA independence is similar. And it presumably does remove one possibility of the courts being able to use the provision, as we've seen they can in cases like the Open Rights Group when it comes to the Article 26 restrictions clause to actually limit what primary legislation can be uh, achieved, uh, well, sorry, well, you know, what, what, what legislation can achieve without a primary legislative change. So, yeah, that, that is interesting. Um, it, on independence generally, I mean, it is true that so I was re-looking up monetary penalties on, 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 on the DPA uh, 1998 legislation. I was quite surprised to see that actually every single iteration of guidance related to that and how this will be enforced requires the ste Secretary of State to approve it. Um, so, so they have been, whereas now maybe they did a GDPR check and realised that that was more open to challenge, it's now only the first draft of guidance of um, DPA and, and GDPR, which uh, requires under the negative uh, procedure, parliamentary uh, approval. So uh, yes, um, it is very significant um, ongoing involvement of government, but it's not entirely without precedent. Um, I am concerned by that, but I'm even more concerned by the proposals which um, seem not to address the extent of literally just a handful of enforcement actions on the back of, you know, tens of thousands of potentially bona fide complaints. And in, if you bring in PECA, of course, the difficulty is, is that, you know, hundreds of thousands of complaints are registered through and that you could have just more and more and more. So I'm, I'm more concerned that the effectiveness of the authority as a champion of, of, of data protection, which I would see as required by the convention as well, might not just be undermined, but there just might not be any way of fessing up of, of the extent to which it might not even be there um, currently. Um, I have slightly deliberately uh, bracketed PECA on pragmatic grounds, that it is just such a complex scheme. It has no count precise Council of Europe um, cognate to it, which makes a comparison uh, very different and very difficult. Um, I mean, I personally think that the, the, uh, the practical overlap with data protection, if you get to online regulation, is, is hugely extensive. I suppose the technical answer is that it, its definition doesn't per se depend on processing and personal data. That, that sounds a, a bit of a bit of a cop out. Um, but uh, it is true that in terms of, ad as far as I can see, even in terms of adequacy decisions and um, uh, the Data Protection Convention, it can't be directly taken into account, um, except, of course, that you get into the whole issue of, well, if there is processing of personal data, then how do you assess the word legal processing? Can you, can you bring in PECA? But then, then, then could, you, could you bring in uh, other things. But there, there's, um, uh, I take your point that, that, that in terms of practical online regulation, and even at a conceptual level in terms of why do we have data protection, the, the overlap is very considerable. Thanks so much, David. I'm so tempted again to abuse my position as chair, but then we could do this all day. And I'm very excited to hear the views of our panelists. Yeah. So, I will introduce our first panelist today, Dr. Orla Linsky. Orla is an associate professor having joined the LSE Law School in 2012 and a visiting professor at the College of Europe, Bruges. She teaches and conducts research in the areas of data protection, technology regulation, digital rights and EU law. She holds an LLB, Law and French, from Trinity College Dublin, an LLM in EU law from the College of Europe and a PhD from the University of Cambridge. Prior to completing her doctorate, she worked as an academic assistant at the College of Europe and in public and private competition law practice in Brussels. She is an editor of International Data Privacy Law, published by OUP, 
and an editorial committee member of the Modern Law Review Journal. She's also currently a member of the Ada Lovelace Institute's Rethinking Data Working Group. Orla, whenever you're ready, thank you. Uh, thanks, Nora, and, and thanks, David. Um, I, I hope nobody was expecting fireworks because um, what I'm about to say <laughs> largely, I think, agrees with um, what David has already set out. So I'll try not to repeat the points that he has made, but I, I completely agree, David, with, with your kind of overall analysis of the proposed reforms that um, largely for, for, for in vast swathes of the, the reform, what we're seeing here is something evolutionary, not something, uh, not that kind of drastic change. Um, however, in, in the written consultation uh, response that I provided with my colleague, um, Dr. Julia Gentile, a colleague of mine at the, the LSE Law Faculty, um, we, we made two points in relation to um, the consultation. And so the first was really that in its overall thrust, what we're seeing is um, a new direction which seeks to kind of move us away from the more rights-based approach to data protection and shifts us towards a more economic model um, for data governance and, and treating data processing. And that, uh, when you look at that, that shift, I think then this, the second point that we made was that this risks bringing us out of line with uh, existing international commitments, as David has said, most obviously um, Convention 108 plus, but also the general direction of travel that we're seeing internationally, which is for um, legal frameworks to be increasingly more rights oriented and less, um, less economic in their kind of in their foundational uh, in, in their foundations. So I'll just kind of elaborate on, on, on those two points. So we think that the, the trust moves away from a kind of a fundamental rights focus in, in, in three key ways. So first of all, because it, the, the proposal seeks to undermine very well-established core data protection principles. So you might think here about things like um, purpose limitation. Um, so we see, for instance, that that kind of broad consent um, for or the, the broad use of data for incompatible purposes where it is in the public interest. So in these circumstances, while the GDPR allows for some flexibility for public interest research, we want to expand out on that flexibility and in essence um, kind of create a blank check <laughs> for public interest data processing. Um, so we saw that as kind of undermining the, a key data protection principle. Another thing you see here is um, a limitation of the ability to balance data protection with other fundamental rights and interests throughout the framework. Um, so a kind of a curtailing of that ability to, to balance data protection in that way. So this is most obviously the case in, for instance, the, um, the fact that the government would like to introduce an exhaustive list of legitimate interests kind of processing. So in essence here, rather than having controllers assess when they can process personal data for a legitimate interest, the government would do that um, ex ante balancing of interests and come up with this closed list. And we actually have case law from the Court of Justice of the EU, which says that that kind of um, exhaustive list is incompatible with EU data protection law. Now, the UK here would have wiggle room post-Brexit, of course, but it's just a, a, an example of, of the way in which um, you have the kind of denuding of the fundamental rights dimension of data protection. But the key thing I want to focus on is, is what has already been discussed. And that is, I think, what I would call the politicization of the, the ICO as an independent regulator. And this is in itself a fundamental rights uh, issue. So we see that there's um, an attack on the independence of the ICO throughout this document in various different ways. So, you know, David has mentioned some of these already. So we see um, an explicit requirement for the ICO to take into account economic growth, competition, public safety, regulatory cooperation. Now, we might say, for instance, that that growth duty that, that is already present in law as a result of the Deregulation Act of 2015. But what, we're, what, what the proposed reform is doing is making this more concrete, holding the ICO to account as to how it takes into account economic growth and innovation when involved in, or, you know, when engaged in decision making. And if you think of some of the more substantive actions that the ICO could have taken in recent years, for instance, around things like ad tech, which has already been mentioned, 
Of course, they could have negative economic in impacts, particularly in the short run. They might arguably have negative impacts on innovation, particularly in the short run. But um, as other data protection regulators in Europe are now recognizing, if they're unlawful, <laughs> they need to be called out as such. So what would, what would this new obligation to balance data protection interests with interests like innovation, what would that mean for the ICO in these types of circumstances? That's left quite open. Um, other things that we could note are things like the, the, the role of the Secretary of State in various ICO processes, um, most notably the approval of some codes of conduct <laughs> in particularly kind of challenging areas. So direct influence there over ICO processes. Um, the role of the Secretary of State in setting the strategic priorities of the ICO as a regulator a task that the ICO thinks um, should uh, be a parliamentary task rather than a government task. Uh, you see that um, the ICO is required to take into account the strategic priorities of the UK government in its international actions. What is that? Acknowledging um, a third country to be adequate <laughs> if it is in the, the strategic interests of the UK to do so, for instance. Again, unclear what exactly that means. Um, and so these types of obligations are um, littered throughout the document and their collective impact is to ensure that the ICO would be subject to either direct or indirect influence um, by, by the government. And, you know, as has already been, been pointed out, this is uh, incompatible or will put the, the UK out of step with um, its international obligations and with the general consensus internationally around the requirement and the need for independent regulation in this area. So two things here, I think. First of all, if you look at the EU-UK adequacy decisions, you see that those adequacy decisions emphasise um, that adherence to ECHR standards, including Convention 108, and I would say the modernised Convention 108, are, and I quote, a kind of a particularly important element of the assessment. In the case law of the Court of Justice of the EU, um, the independence of regulatory authorities is looked at as an essential component of the fundamental right to data protection. And so these changes really risk kind of jeopardizing adequacy as, as a kind of a starting point. But also, as, as David and Nora have pointed out, if you look at the, the wording of Convention 108, um, the modernised convention itself, it also requires supervisory authorities to act with complete independence and impartiality in um, enforcing their, uh, in carrying out their, their, their duties and enforcing their powers. And um, the Global Privacy Assembly actually produced a very interesting paper last year on this, ironically chaired by the ICO, I should say, um, on this notion of independence and data protection laws. And it was a comparative paper. It looked at 10 international data protection frameworks, um, including GDPR and Convention 108, but also the African Union Convention, the Ibero-American Ibero Conventions, et cetera, um, OECD, APEC. And eight out of 10 of those um, frameworks have an explicit requirement of independence um, in them. And so... Uh, even the OECD privacy framework, where it's not explicitly stated, notes that um, decision making should be free of any uh, perceived or actual uh, interference or bias. And so for me, this is really one of the, the, the critical points um, that, that emerges from this, this discussion paper. And I think, you know, looking at this with a, a kind of slightly more academic hat on, it really raises two important um, questions about the independence and the interdependence of regulatory agencies. So, um, you know, the ICO itself has very diplomatically stated that um, it would like to see more specificity on the proposed governance model and accountability mechanisms that would preserve its independence. Um, so, you know, who, who would disagree with that? But I, I think we could also query here to what extent it is appropriate for data protection authorities to take into account explicitly these other considerations. Should we just be thinking of that as um, something that is inherent in data protection law through the principle of proportionality? Or are we really 
changing the nature of data protection regulators by making this more explicit um, and as part of their mandate. As David says, shifting us from a rights focus to something that's more controller oriented. And the second thing, this the question this really kind of raises for me is, um, what, how, how are data protection regulators distinct from other regulators, if at all? Um, in in, in the, the, the discussion document, you see that comparisons are made between um, the ICO and other economic regulators like Ofgem and Ofwat and Ofcom, et cetera. Um, can we compare the ICO to these regulators? Should we be treating it in the same way as these regulators? Uh, now, we could say at the moment in the UK, there is no regulator more important than Ofgen because <laughs> uh, we don't like to be able to pay our heating bills. Uh, on the other hand, the ICO itself says or emphasizes that it is a rights based regulator and therefore it is unique amongst these other regulators and shouldn't be treated um, in the same way as these economic regulators. So is there a different rationale for independence in this context? Do we need to um, uphold the independence of the ICO uh, more stringently because precisely it protects uh, fundamental rights like data protection, privacy, et cetera, in the digital context? So there are my kind of brief comments on, um, on, on well, what David has to say and also on the, the document itself. Thank you so much, Orla. I thought that was really fascinating set of insights and very detailed feedback on David's paper. I'm sorry there weren't fireworks, but I think you provided an awful lot of food for thought. I think your point regarding the fact that the proposals so far that have been put forward are more evolutionary rather than, than radical and revolutionary speaks very much to, to David's paper. I would like to put the cat amongst the pigeons in that respect to say that is it at all possible that we are playing regulatory Jenga here with the fundamentals of data protection law? If we remove independent oversight and we remove any semblance of the proportionality principle and how it applies across the key principles of GDPR and the key legal grounds for pro processing, it may not be a radical evolution of a new framework, but it very much dismantles the core protection of fundamental rights that I think you and David spoke, you know, very very eloquently to. Excuse me. So I think I think there are quite significant red flags there in terms of, as you said, the direction of travel that this may take. And I think the points that you made regarding the threats to the operational and functional independence of the ICO are very significant, both regarding the rights-based approach and also regarding the threat, the risk this poses to both of the UK's data adequacy decisions, where it's clearly stated very, very very detailed in both that it was one of the key elements on which the data adequacy decisions were based, that independent oversight was being provided. And there was compliance with not just the EU acquis, but also the ECHR legal system, including, as you mentioned, EU uh, Court of Justice case law, but also the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, which also has very much established that there should be there must be independent oversight particularly when it comes to access by public authorities to personal data so thanks so much Orla and again I feel like I'm in the same situation as I was was with David's paper I could I could stay here all day um, engaging more but that would be very unfair of me because we have some fantastic contributions from our other panelists and I'm delighted to introduce our second discussant joining us today, Dr. Malet Mili Sameta, who is Head of Public Policy at the Open Data Institute. And prior to joining the Institute in 2020, Mili was Senior Policy Advisor at the Royal Society, the Independent Scientific Academy of the UK, where she led the Society's policy program on data and digital disruption, including projects on data governance, data science skills, and privacy enhancing technologies. Millie was previously program manager at the Alan Turing Institute, Britain's National Institute for Data Science and AI, where she managed the Turing's research partnership programs in health and in finance economic data science. She has also worked at the Medical Research Council, served on an advisory group at Chatham House, and holds degrees in philosophy from Oxford, Cambridge, and York. Excuse me. 
Millie, you're very welcome whenever you're ready. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much, Nora. Thank you for the invitation. And um, no fireworks in mind, but I hope to put the cat among the pigeons by suggesting that maybe the proposed reforms aren't revolutionary enough, um, but I'll get that in a moment. Um, David, thank you very much for your really brilliant presentation. I love the comparative approach you know you, you provided, which also made different kinds of analysis and interpretation possible. Um, and all I, I really agree with what you're saying about the kind of the, the potential trade-off or you know false dichotomy between economic um, kind of impact and rights and thinking about that a bit differently. Um, so um, just to pick up on that point, um, in our consultation response to the proposed reforms at the ODI, and we observed that you know, the economic case that was being presented by government was around cutting the short-term administrative costs around compliance around data protection in order to make more data available for the economy um, and for kind of you know, positive economic impacts that way. Um, but we think it's really important that policymakers take a sort of theory of change approach to these kinds of interventions and think about, you know, the impacts over time. Um, so a research report that was conducted for us by Frontier Economics uh, on the value, the economic value of trust shows that, you know, you've got to make interventions um, that don't diminish trust over time, because if a short term intervention is, is harmful in some way, longer term, you'll have less less data available in the economy. You know, so we just really encourage that kind of that kind of mindset. Um, and I think that one possible way in which, you know, a kind of a short term intervention might have long, longer term negative economic impacts is if the short term intervention makes economic changes that aren't inclusive, you know, or aren't sustainable and, you know, or, or kind of harm social cohesion in societies or are seen to kind of be at odds with societal values. So that's a, a very immediate threat to kind of achieving the economic goals that they'd like to. Um, I think there's also a threat around, you know, and elsewhere in government, we have um, we've seen ambitions for the UK to be a global hub for data and digital services. In the AI strategy, there's an ambition to be a kind of world leader around AI standards and AI ethics. So again, it's making sure that these ambitions are joined up and that what the UK does around data protection doesn't undermine its kind of international objectives around being seen as a global and trusted hub for data services and for AI ethics. Um, but specifically on the kind of reforms, I've got three sort of four main, four main points to make. And this is where I'm going to kind of, you know, maybe challenge David a bit in terms of, well, maybe they could have been more revolutionary. And the headings might roughly are kind of limitations of GDPR, uh, the nature of data governance, um, the context in which the possible reforms might take place. Um, and then also thinking about future proofing. And I think, Nora, this speaks to your comment about regulatory gender. So I'll just try to say, make a couple of points on each of those. Um, so on acknowledging the limitations of GDPR, so GDPR, I think it, it, it was the first cohesive and consolidated approach to data protection. And so it's had a lot of political and economic influence as a first mover, not just in, in Europe, but also globally, right? The kind of alignment with GDPR for global trade. Um, but it has its origins as a consumer right and as an individual right. And its origins as a consumer right means it's not necessarily best suited to navigating social benefits of collective goods, such as public health or the environment. And its origins as an individual right might mean it's not necessarily best suited for navigating collective rights and collective harms. So as an example of collective rights around data, um, so sometimes data about me is also data about other people. I'll give an example. So my DNA, my sort of genetic data, is also intrinsically data about my biological family. So if I give consent for disclosures around my DNA, my genetic data, and I've given consent and my individual rights have all been kind of upheld, it's also kind of going to disclose kind of information about my biological family and they haven't necessarily been consulted, right? So that's an example of there might be collective rights actually around, around data. And then thinking about sort of um, collective harms, privacy harms are not equitably distributed in our society. For example, some communities are over surveilled, you know, and so there's the, the data collection about them is felt much more intrusively because the kinds of questions asked means that they're overrepresented in some data sets. If you think about who in our society is vulnerable to surveillance. Um, similarly, in the other direction, certain data breaches might disproportionately be harmful to some, either to a community or a group. So the same data breach might have different impacts and some communities might be more harmed by it than others. So thinking about collective harms as well and who needs to be protected as a group is something that we should maybe consider beyond individual rights and, and so on. Um, and that's an opportunity, I think, that if, you know, if a jurisdiction was going to go further than GDPR, do something different than GDPR to, to address that gap. Um, and so it would be maybe nice to see to see that revolutionary spirit <laughs> um, in, in proposed reforms for UK data protection. And again, I think that's consistent with thinking about being you know, a, world, a world leader in data and digital services and AI ethics and so on. The second area where I think there's maybe scope to be a bit more revolutionary might be around um, a holistic vision around data governance. 
So it could be, I think that some of the controversy around the proposals has been because of the interpretation of, um, you know, that they might weaken data protection obligations. But another way of thinking about this might be to think of data protection as a subset of data stewardship or data governance. And when you take a step back and make that conceptual shift, then you, you get a different sense of the kind of obligations as well as the possibilities. So um, if you think about data stewardship, um, it covers more than data protection because it also includes things like, you know, establishing data standards, which supports data interoperability and data linkage. Um, and so it supports making the data useful to others in, in more ways than just kind of protecting and controlling access to it. The nature of data stewardship also means that the way the data is collected or gathered in the first place and the conditions under which, you know, the kind of um, it's, it's stewarded for a community or for individuals means that the trust is sort of been built or it's, it's built into the governance and the purpose. And so a data steward might also have obligations to share data in some cases if that sharing data or ensuring the data is used is going to achieve certain goals. So that gives you an alternative to thinking about data protection, you know, that very kind of like almost um, defensive, you know, kind of binary accessing data or not, to think more holistically about data use, data sharing, the obligations to use data for public good, um, the nature of trust in kind of like allowing others to access data and so on. So again, I think there was an opportunity there to do something a bit more, think about it more sustainably and inclusively, and maybe not in the potentially adversarial way of, you know, data protection, um, individual rights and, 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 and risks of um, data protection um, not being upheld. Um, I think there's also a third opportunity to kind of um, maybe be a bit more revolutionary, and that was around thinking about the context in which these reforms might come in or reforms like this might come in. Um, and I think it's really important that the, um, that the ambition for the reforms is matched by the capability in the society. And we, in our consultation response, we said it's really important that there's equal commitment or equal investment in ensuring data literacy in organisations and in publics. So again, making sure that organizations across sectors, not just in industry, um, and not just big organizations, but thinking about SMEs, thinking about civil society organizations, um, thinking about, you know, making sure that all of them understand, um, understand their responsibilities and cutting, cutting red tape is not the only way to do that. It's also about increasing data literacy because then they're going to be more better suited or better able to make use of the data that they have access to or that they steward. Related, it's really important to have that kind of balancing investment in data literacy in the wider public, um, because if people understand how data about them might be used, what it could be used for, the conditions under which it can be used, then you've, you've got that accountability and that trust. And when you've got that accountability and trust, when you've got that transparency, that actually gives you more room to manoeuvre in terms of legislation, I think. So it's a kind of counterpoint, right? If there's if, if, if people understand what you're doing um, and can make informed consent about it and they're empowered and there's transparency and accountability, you can maybe be more a bit more ambitious about, about your framework, right? So I think that's a different way maybe um, for policymakers to think about it. And then the final heading that I think it could be interesting to think about, you know, where, where could we be more revolutionary? Um, so our research has, and this is, Nora, this is going to speak to your point about, you know, regulatory gender. So our research has shown that when it comes to trust in data practices, the conditions of trust are not dynamic, are not static. They are dynamic, which means they change over time. They are contextual, which means they depend on the use case. Um, and they are relational, which means they depend on the history of the relationship or the dynamics. So think about power asymmetries. Think about what's happened in the past in relation to, say, maybe you know, certain use case or certain communities and, and so on. So if you think about that dynamism, that contextualism and that kind of relational aspect, how can, you, how can you develop a regulatory framework that meets all these needs? Um, and in terms of the data economy, we think that some of the biggest future opportunities will be around new use cases, new products and services with data, new data ecosystems. So then the open question is, how do you develop an approach to data protection or data stewardship that can be adaptive? you know, that can, that can keep responding to this. Otherwise in five years time, you're gonna have more reforms and so on. So then a good way to think about this is how do you invest in developing that trust and that literacy such that the, the you know, the, the, the adaptiveness can be built in um, and, and, and it can be done in a sustainable and inclusive way and it can be responsive to future needs um, and, and future opportunities. Um, and that the ODI, the way we think about these is in terms of data futures. So we kind of, if you imagine a pendulum, you know, in, in a kind of balanced position. So if the pendulum swings in one direction, you get what we call a, a data fearing future, where there is 
mistrust of how data can be used. Um, and so it just can't be used to fulfill its kind of, you know, the, the, the positive impacts it could have for society and economy. But if the pendulum swings the other way, you get a data hoarding future. And again, data is not fulfilling its full potential because it's being hoarded because, you know, maybe companies overestimate the value of it. So how do you how do you get the right kind of data availability in society and economy that it fulfills its potential? So that that trust, that sustainable inclusive trust is necessary for longer term balance the pendulum doesn't keep swinging and if you i think if policymakers make that their goal in thinking about you know any reforms that might make around data protection that might allow us to step away between what might be an adversarial or combative approach to data protection um, and individual data rights um, so those are my my thoughts for now uh, happy to take questions or maybe pick up on them later Thanks so much, Millie. You have well and truly broadened the horizons of this conversation on data protection law in its, I think, very foundational forms. I think you raised some really significant questions that I think, to be fair to David, he couldn't cover all of them in, in just one paper. But, you know, asking those very big, important questions about what how do we actually define data protection as a right what does it actually cover is it this umbrella right that provides protection for a collection of rights i think to be fair in the dcms consultation there was actually speaking to the points that you raised some very interesting points about the relationship between equality law and data protection law, which I think was very welcome in terms of expanding that conversation around the social value of data, but also, and Orla's also covered this in scholarship that she has done previously, about the relationship of data protection to other rights and how it also engages with them, but also is an enabler of them. And this is also part and parcel of, as you mentioned, Millie, the origins of data protection as a right, um, which of course are, are incredibly complex because there are actually some deeply rooted individualistic human rights foundations there. For some, it is a sub right of data privacy or the right to the right to, uh, the right to respect for to private life under Article Eight of the European Convention of Human Rights or the Human Rights Act. You know, under EU law, it has been interpreted and developed very differently. It's its own fundamental right now under the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. So I think that ongoing ambiguity about what the right to data protection actually means and actually represents in both a legal and in a very pragmatic application and context is a very important set of issues that you've raised and one that would be wonderful if it was tackled by this consultation going forward. So I really uh, applaud that point that you've made. I think you're absolutely right. This is a brave new world in terms of the connected world we're in, smart cities, internet of things, biometric collection of data, which is quite ubiquitous in most urban spaces. Data linkage and data interoperability are, are huge issues and they should be addressed more, particularly if, 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 if as you have you know, pointed out so eloquently, if the UK is seeking to be a world leader in this space in terms of digital rights and digital economy, this is the space to be in, in terms of leading the way. I mean, the current benchmarks are generally being set within the EU and at the EU legislative level, those conversations about intersectionality are happening between data governance and consumer fairness that you raised. So if the UK is going to take up the, the baton in that respect, then now would be the moment, as, as you well point out. And I think, you know, the points you've raised about a more holistic vision of data protection and, and the social value of data is incredibly important. And again, I think in, in fairness to David, I think that's an awful lot to ask of one man and one, one paper on data protection reform. <laughs> but I think these points are incredibly valid and, and very pertinent. And again, Millie, um, we could talk about this all day and I hope we get to sometime soon, but that would stop us from me introducing our last but not at all least discussant on our panel today, Dr. Ruben Binns. Ruben is an Associate Professor of Human-Centered Computing at the University of Oxford Computer Science Department. Between 2018 and 2020, he was a postdoctoral research fellow in AI at the Information Commissioner's Office, addressing and dealing with issues including AI, machine learning and data protection. 
In 2015, he was awarded a PhD in web science from the University of Southampton. And that same year, he joined the Department of Computer Science at the University of Oxford as a postdoctoral researcher. His research and publications intersect between computer science, law and philosophy, with a focus on data protection, machine learning and the regulation of and by technology. And just as a quick intervention myself, Ruben, given you know this fascinating set of experiences, um, ex experience and insights you've had working within the ICO, perhaps um, if you have time, you could address a point that Millie raised with regard to data literacy, because that is addressed in the GDPR, Millie, in terms of being one of the many functions and many roles of the Information Commissioner's Office. So if that's something that could be carried on and expanded upon, perhaps that's something that can be explored further in terms of UK data protection reform. Ruben, whenever you're ready. Thank you. So, yes, thanks, uh, David, for a fantastic paper. And thanks um, to all of them, Millie, for uh, an excellent set of interventions. Um, so I, I, I suppose my role here is probably to, to focus on some of the kind of AI and tech angles to this. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to do that. And I think uh, David's paper is a great basis for, for thinking about these things. Um, so obviously, yeah, given my, given my experience at the ICO, this, these are issues that are sort of close to my heart and, and ones that I'm uh, you know, continually thinking about and, and are very complicated. But, um, but so when, when, I, when I read the, the, the proposal, um, I, did, I did feel coming away from it that, that yes, there was sort of, um, as, as David said, some of the more radical proposals were in relation to automated decision-making. So particularly the, the uh, suggestion of, of scrapping Article 22. Um, I suppose there's, a, there's, there's an ambiguous question as to whether that's an AI issue and to what extent, um, what, you know, it's obviously an AI issue, but it's broader than that in the sense that automated decision-making in general is, is broader than AI. Um, but there's also a question as to how uh, I think if you if you read the the, the, the document, it's, it's pretty clear that on that particular point, the drafters were, were keen to, to attribute the source of that suggestion as, as the, the Tigger report. Um, so so it kind of perhaps a bit of suggesting a bit of distance there. Um, but nonetheless, it, that would certainly be a, a very big departure um, and, and one that would take us further away than even the, the convention, um, as David said. Um, so th those are some of the more radical proposals in relation to AI, but there are uh, there is quite a lot of discussion about building trustworthy AI systems, um, which don't really suggest much that would be radically different, but they do raise a lot of questions and um, a lot of concerns about, about AI. So, um, they, the, the, the sort of tone of, of, the, of the piece suggests that they want um, to make it easier for AI practitioners in the UK to develop AI systems, um, which is, you know, um, in, in principle, a good thing. Um, and they want to do that by effectively, you know, making the processes of deciding what you can do to, to build an AI system when it involves personal data easier and simpler and, and to, to kind of... Uh, get rid of some uh, perceived ambiguity. Um, I say perceived because I do think that actually many of the issues they touch on are already answered by the existing regime. So um, they talk about quite a lot about um, making it uh, easier uh, and encouraging controllers to um, process data, um, including special category data, um, in order to test AI systems for bias. This is something that's very that they're very keen on doing. Um, and they do note that, that, that actually there are already uh, conditions you know, in schedule, schedules that allow this to be done under um, you know, monitoring um, for uh, uh, you know, disparities um, by race, uh, by gender and so on. Um, so that those, those provisions already exist, but nonetheless, the, the report points to uh, kind of concerns in the AI industry that, that maybe this isn't allowed. So it's kind of, it, it seems like the, the, these parts of the, of the reform want to basically make it clear that this is possible. And one way would, would, would be to add an existing uh, condition in Schedule 1 um, uh, or, or clarify the existing one. Um, so, so that so those are some of the, the suggested reforms to encourage this new activity. 
But I think the fact that these that's really one of the only concrete sort of suggestions for changing the existing regime suggests that the, actually the existing regime is pretty good. Um, and certainly my experience talking to AI practitioners was that um, actually, you know, there is, you know, I was expecting there to be many more unresolved interpretive questions when it comes to applying data protection or to AI. And actually, I think the existing law is, is pretty, pretty good in, in covering a lot of the, the questions that AI practitioners had. Um, so, so I, so I don't think there is as much ambiguity as, as, as uh, at least legally, as, as is portrayed by, um, by this consultation and also by industry. Um, that said, um, it might be that what's needed is, is just more clarity about what the existing law says. Um, but um, it does seem to be the only real thing that could be pointed to as, a, as, a, as a, something that needed to, to be changed, aside from the more radical points about removing Article 22. Um, one of the suggestions for resolving this supposed ambiguity is to add to the list of um, presumed legitimate interests uh, conditions that you would be able to, to, to process special category data for the purposes of debiasing an AI system. So that would be, you know, it, um, all of mentioned this as one of the one of the things that would be quite a radical departure from at least from the from the EU um, law. Um, I, I, I think that would be quite uh, troubling because you can imagine you know plenty of cases where uh, it would be disproportionate to to test for bias um, to, to collect special category data to test for bias for very low stakes AI decision making, right? That that clearly you'd want to have some sort of ability to, to make a, an assessment as to whether it's okay to collect all that data and process it for that purpose. Obviously, in high stakes decisions and in even even in medium stakes decisions, it's very important that we do these kind of tests. But I think it, it would I would be quite concerned if there was a, a kind of carte blanche um, to use legitimate interests as a basis for for doing that in any case. Um, more broadly, the, the the way that they that the uh, that the proposed reforms seek to uh, to sort of cut down the existing um, uh, provisions around fairness, I think, are, are perhaps slightly misguided in their interpretation of fairness as a principle. So I think David pointed this out that it's always been about more than just transparency. If you look to the early um, Council of Europe resolutions, you see fairness and unfair discrimination reference there. Um, it's listed throughout other data protection laws around the world. Brazilian data protection law mentions uh, this kind of thing as well. So that's that's an issue. Um, I think the, the problem here is that if the aim is to create an environment where AI industry can uh, develop systems with less red tape in the UK and then compete by you know, compete globally, selling them elsewhere. The problem is that if you're if you're selling an AI system developed in the UK to a to a country which has a lower standard, then the cost of producing it will still be higher in the UK because we still have a, quite a, a you know reasonable um, set of, of 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 constraints here. So there would still be costs that would that would be higher than uh, another country. But if you wanted to sell it into the EU, you would obviously then have to impose all the same kinds of constraints that, that an EU data controller would want. So you'd need to build a system that had the ability for human review. And so all of the, 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 the regulations that are applied at the EU level would still be things that would have to be built by a UK AI company. So I, I feel like there's not, I, I can't see the, the sort of competitive niche you know, other than you know, domestic AI industry selling within the UK. Um, just quickly, finally, on, on the sort of economic side of things, I think the uh, what, what's interesting to me, I mean, I, I completely agree with everything that, that all have said about this, but um, what's interesting to me is, is suggestions like, for instance, requiring the ICO to undergo an impact assessment for guidance. And I think that really misconstrues what the nature of ICO guidance is. So if you're thinking about a regulator like the FCA, when they create, you know, regulatory requirements, those are new requirements that didn't exist before. When the ICO produces guidance, it's merely clarifying what the law already is. So that so the, the cost of, of compliance is actually 
should be reduced as a result of guidance because guidance is there to actually do the work that would otherwise have to be done by lawyers working for these companies, these, these controllers. So I think, you know, and, and so that, that I think is one of the areas where I really think that the appeal to, you know, having to, ha having to think about economic impacts would really kind of just get the whole role of, of the ICO actually quite confused, especially when it, when it comes to guidance. Um, so, yeah, just a, a, some considerations for the AI sector, and then a, just a, a final thought on the on the economic uh, impact assessments for, for guidance. Um, sorry if I run over time there, but um, look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Ruben, and your contribution was really fantastic in that it focused very specifically on Article Twenty Two and related requirements and safeguards, and it also speaks. I think quite significantly back to David's point in the paper that in terms of substantial change, there are very con very few concrete examples, but that Article 22 is a notable exception in that regard. And in terms of the changes that are being made, I think it also very helpfully draws together all of the other contributions and points that Millie and Orla also made in terms of the shift away from this human rights or a human rights centered approach in terms of the data processing speaks more to the, the policy values that perhaps were highlighted quite frequently in the briefing paper on the benefits of Brexit published by the UK government this week on pro-innovation, pro-agility for business, but a notable scarcity of a focus on a human-centered or a human rights-based approach. I think the point you made to regarding the over-complexity of the law and, legislat and legislation surrounding Article 22 and also compliance and guidance, I think that's, that's incredibly relevant in terms of the overstatement in the consultation paper by D DCMS and that it is questionable how helpful it would be to have such stringent control over ICO guidance because the challenge seems more to be in the provision of more specific guidance that's sector specific rather than you know this very useful general high level guidance in terms of article 22 that all sectors will find useful and if you have interference or if you have that level of bias that Orla and David mentioned in terms of the Secretary of State and, and, and other sources of influence, then it also then questions the ultimate role then of the ICO in terms of what guidance is being provided and who it's being provided for. So these are all very important and incredibly relevant points. Thanks so much. So David, I'd like to give you the opportunity now to respond to all of the points raised in the interventions. And we do have a number of questions and comments in the Q&A box below. If any of you would like to quickly address them if you have time, um, because we are coming up on um, 15 minutes close to the hour. So if we have time, we can address some of those questions before we finish up. But for now, David, if you'd like to address any of the points or comments that were made by Orla, Millie and Ruben, thank you. Absolutely. Th thank you, Nora. I can't promise to uh, have covered every single one, to be honest, but uh, may maybe um, that conversation can continue. I mean, I tend to agree with you that the uh, GDPR and the whole origin of data protection does have a, a a a wider canvas than 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 might be thought, uh, and that even say the concept of of personal data and when it will relate to uh, uh, one or more individuals. I think this is picking up on one of the questions that was asked in the Q and A. That data can be about more than one individuals, and then they all have the individual rights, and and that can be uh, very difficult to implement, but 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 can give um very real rights but that that, 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 to, that said of course there are some really interesting and important um interactions with equality law uh and uh, uh cons consumer and 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 a competition law um i think certainly in terms of 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 the european origins of data protection the human rights 
focus was fairly clear early on. It is true that, as, as all has written about, um, uh, when the EU got involved first off, it, 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 the EU was much more of a clearly economic organisation. And so maybe it got that uh, that 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 that, that flavour as well. Um, I, I should, by the way, thank uh, Millie, Orla, Reuven, uh, and you, Nora, uh, for for all the the the, the, the brilliant and interesting uh, comments. By the way, um, so, so 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 that's sort of one aspect. I mean, another aspect is um, I think I'll, I'll I'll mainly concentrate on on two more aspects. Focusing on on all as focus on independent regulation and the centrality of independent regulation, I completely agree. But I do think we really do need to be talking more about the regulation as well as the independent. I mean, there is a big elephant in the room, which is that, you know, there is sort of a handful of actions actually finally taken by our regulator uh, in, 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 in entire years go by, you know, when... Um, you know, report after report, even ones commissioned by the office themselves, shows systematic and gravely serious illegality on an industrial scale. Where is the regulation? I mean, you know, uh, there used to be higher levels of regulation in terms of specific final actions. Years and years ago, when the level of threat and the level of infraction was much, much less. It was still serious, but it was much, much less. So, you know, we have a, a regulator very much stressing in annual reports, I think two two times ago, that, you know, three quarters of its resources are going to um, engagement activities. And it's having this huge influence on these corporations by going out to California and talking to them. I mean, I'm sceptical to be honest, because actually I would have thought they would prioritise their business model within the contours of what they're likely to be forced or, or not forced to do to protect rights. I could be wrong, but I would have thought that that's likely to be the, 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 the main limit rather than uh, outward engagement, which doesn't say there's no role for outward engagement. But when you have case law saying that the primary function of a regulator, for, you know, is, is, is to um, monitor and enforce the law, First of all, that seems right. Secondly, it's binding case law. And, 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 and thirdly, um, it would actually address people's concerns, which is that year after year, serious uh, issues seem to be unaddressed or not effectively addressed. So regulation as well as independent regulation. Uh, and, and I'm worried that the proposals aren't going to help us down that line. Although don't forget, there is the possibility that the House of Lords might be encouraged to, rather like it did with the DPA in 19, 2018, come up with some... Uh, interesting amendments to this area. And I think that might be somewhere to start making the ICO accountable for actually delivering for the data subject. Um, the third thing about sort of being more radical, I do want to just touch on this, um, because actually, at a purely substantive level, I think ultimately data protection does need to be more radical. I think there are some fundamental problems built into the GDPR framework. I mean, it isn't sensible to treat, say, a hairdresser making an appointment with someone um, via text or email as equivalent to Google's mass um, profiling of uh, billions of, of data points. Uh, this is This is really not sensible. It dates from a period where, you know, 50 years ago, computers were highly specialised and technical. It's not been the case for decades. It hasn't been addressed. This gap between, you know, what do you do about email? What do you do about uh, uh, text? What do you do about minor processing? It's never been addressed. We, we need to address it. it what, there was an attempt to address it actually in Sweden. Uh, some very interesting thinking around sort of a more misuse model for uh, processing that wasn't systematically organised. And we might actually have something to learn from other countries which do have laws which talk about the difference between systematic organisation and non-systematic. That doesn't mean, I think, in a European framework that data protection won't apply at all, um, but using the restrictions clauses in the um, convention very robustly to create a more nuanced regime, it's far, far overdue. And it's only not been addressed because I go back to the very, very poor level of enforcement and implementation. 
um, if you actually implemented it, it would it would be impossible in many circumstances. So let's sort that out, but let's combine it with 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 proper regulation. Uh, I should say, by the way, that, that there were many many other points around um, uh, AI being being narrower than 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 other forms of of automation around collective harms around. Um, uh, uh, privacy harms on different groups, which um, I think definitely is part of the debate. As I say, I think that they can be, they can in principle be addressed by, by data protection. I think establishing the ICO as a board could be a very good thing because you need different entities to take or sub-entities. So the ideal, I think, would be a board where different people within that board took responsibility for some of the major issues that are arising. But there's there's sort of bound to have to be, and there should be, an interface with other areas of law, like equality law and 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 uh competition law. I mean data protection probably covers too much actually. Uh, but that said, we need regulation and we need protection. So to some extent you want to keep hold of it in order to have some kind of framework for people. But um you know having a sole commissioner being responsible for virtually everything digital to do with human beings is clearly not a not an effective model, uh, and 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 um, and to some extent that 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 could be addressed by better interaction with other regulators, which I think is beginning uh, to develop quite quite a lot. Thanks so much, David. There was an awful lot to respond to and to address. So very well done. I think on picking up on a lot of the key points there raised by the panel in response to your paper. I think the point you made regarding the the very broad scope of data protection and the the necessity to reconsider that in terms of the vast technological developments over the past 20, 30 years is as relevant uh, a concern as ever. And, and you know, Millie also raised this. So I think that's something that you know is worth consideration in the consultation process as it goes forward. I think the point you made too regarding the intersectionality and greater cooperation, just not just between legislative frameworks in terms of competition and consumer fairness, but also amongst the regulatory oversight authorities is also a very important one. These um, resources have limits in terms of their capacity and their functions and tasks. So greater cooperation has, has already led to some very interesting enforcement and developments at the EU level and also within the UK. So that's a very interesting space to watch. And just to give a little bit of attention very quickly to some of the really interesting and insightful questions that have been raised by the audience. Uh, Jessica's raised the points regard has raised the point, excuse me, regarding how collective rights are currently handled under the framework in place at the moment. And we've also had another comment, I would say, rather than a question making the point that some of the reforms being put forward in the DCMS consultation paper on UK data protection law could be quite significant indeed in terms of their impact on fundamental rights and in terms of undermining the principle of purpose limitation going forward. And uh, Jen Pearson from Defend Digital Me. Uh, raises a very a very important, uh, very specific question regarding the data adequacy decisions and particularly on the issue of the immigration exemption with regard to placing limits on data subject rights, which is incredibly important, but I think it just falls slightly outside of the scope of everything that we've been discussing today. I think the data adequacy decisions that have been granted by the EU to the UK warrant an entire seminar all by themselves in terms of proper review and, and analysis. But thanks so much for those, those questions and for those comments. And finally, with six minutes on the clock to go, I would like to give everybody that fantastic task of having a minute each to sum up their thoughts on this current debate and very important area of law moving forward. Perhaps we could begin in reverse, Ruben, and we will conclude with your final thoughts, David. So Ruben, whenever you're ready, thank you. Thanks. Um, well, I suppose, um, let me zoom out and think about, you know, where we, where, based on all this, where we could be headed in terms of what the UK might look like in, say, 10 years in relation to all this, right? So 
So one, so one, one possibility is that we end up with the UK kind of neither meeting the standards of the EU, uh, and therefore, even if we maintain adequacy somehow, uh, not being able to sell products, uh, digital products to EU member states, uh, not being able to sell products to uh, digital products to other countries because they have, you know, we can't compete with them in terms of, uh, you know, they have much lower sort of barriers to innovation. So we end up with with something that doesn't really have any economic kind of global uh, sort of uh, economic advantages to it. Um, but at the same time, doesn't really protect people either. Um, and so that that would be the kind of, if I think given the sort of some of the indications of possible directions, that, that seems like a, a, a distinct possibility. If I had to outline a more positive sort of path forward for the UK, it would be one where um, we actually sort of recognise that, you know, technology AI systems are um, are already kind of uh, a, a globalized commodity that that is not something that you can you know compete against the big tech giants with but rather maybe there are opportunities to build uh, you know services and systems which are um, actually more responsive to the ethical problems of of, of the day the emerging ethical problems that are actually, um, you know, not just technology components, but the, the services that are combined with deep expertise about uh, particular risks and particular um, compliance needs in, in specific domains. And that could actually be a niche that, you know, UK um, organisations, both private sector, public sector could really specialise in. And I think that a data protection uh, regime that supports that would be really positive. Um, so that, yeah, two kind of worst case scenario and, and, and best case scenario um, for the next 10 years. Thanks so much, Ruben. Very balanced, I have to say, impressively so. Millie, whenever you're ready, thank you. Um, thanks, Nora. And thanks, David, for the really great comments. Um, so it's, I need a bit of warm up time to be revolutionary, but I'm going to try my best. Um, so I think I just took a moment to think about what's at stake here, you know, and it's not if not often that new legislation is proposed around data laws, right? Um, so I think it's worth getting it right. And I think what's at stake here is um, the nature of the kind of data intensive technologies It's the changing rate of change, right? So if, if an intervention is made now and it's not trusted and it's not effective, if you think about the kind of the, the, the political length of kind of public memory, it might be it might be sort of three or four governments down the line when they can hope to make an adjustment, right? It's, it takes time before you've got enough political capital to try again or try something different. But in terms of technology evolution, a lot can happen in that time. You know, so it's not like you can do it now and then adjust it in five years time and still hope to be kind of global competitor on these strategic technologies. So I think if the UK wants to kind of like, you know, secure the, the economic and political and all the kind of benefits that we could have from these strategic technologies, which are very data intensive, it, it's worth really being careful to get this intervention right, because we may not get another chance um, for some time. And by then, the technology will have moved on without us. Thanks so much, Millie. I think you've summed up the moment uh, incredibly well in this being a possible moment of truth for UK policymakers in terms of the future of UK data protection law reform, uh, particularly in line with the ambitions of the UK to be a world leader in the space of data ethics and also the digital economy. So thanks so much for that. Orla, thank you. Thanks. Sir. Maybe just two points in response. So I, I think just to, to comment on David's point about the need here, not just for independent enforcement, but for actual enforcement. <laughs> you know, clearly, I think that's that, that's the case. But um, the ICO has been very kind of keen to stress that it's not an ombudsperson, so it doesn't want to necessarily deal with kind of low level individual complaints. And you can see that the reforms kind of tried to push those out of the picture almost entirely by requiring people to go directly to a controller um, to try and get to try and get redress. But equally, we were seeing that kind of lack of action on um, the big ticket items like ad tech, ad tech and others. And um the, the upper tribunal uh, of uh, the information tribunal seems to be saying judicial review is the answer here. So I, I think it would be interesting to try 
kind of chart um, a, a track down which you could force greater accountability. And then maybe just to, to address Millie's kind of really important point that if this is um, a, a kind of a window of time to make big changes, I mean, I had never been kind of thinking of the reforms that were proposed in that way, because they're simply not ambitious enough. They don't really try to put data protection in any kind of broader um, data governance context. And I think while completely recognizing that the data protection framework is individualistic in, in many ways, the concept of personal data and the idea that individuals enforce their rights, um, I would be kind of concerned about stripping back any key principles at the moment in the hope that down the line we would have something that would give us kind of more collective rights. So I would rather kind of consolidate what we have Build, an, build you know, an, a complementary framework and then reconsider data protection law rather than doing it on any kind of other order. And there I do think that if we kind of took aside or uh, pushed to the side the, the, the definition of personal data um, and said that the, the governance principles that you find in Article 5 of the data protection framework, so purpose limitation, data minimization, fairness, are they not still appropriate data processing principles, even in a collective, you know, thinking about this from a more societal and collective perspective? So are they not still um, kind of fit for purpose now and for the, for the future um, if we removed some of the scoping constraints of data protection law? Thanks so much, Orla. Absolutely. I think I would be very much along the same lines of thinking that we certainly don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are some incredibly important foundations and leading benchmarks in terms of key data protection principles and legal grounds for processing that stem not just from uh, EU data protection law, but I think also uh, that are very well established within the Article 8 ECHR case law of the European Court of Human Rights. So there are certainly, in addition to the Council of Europe Modernised Convention 108, some key principles that I think would, as Orla highlighted, be just as relevant to the protection of group privacy or group data protection, as you were highlighting, Millie, as they would to more focused individualistic areas that also still warrant protection, even in this era of AI and machine learning and other emerging forms of data processing, one will not trump or be mutually exclusive towards the other. What we need is a more comprehensive and responsive framework, which perhaps is one of the silver linings that, that could emerge from this, this process, taking a very optimistic, perhaps, note uh, to conclude on myself. But last but not at all least, David, we're on the edge of our seats with your waiting on your, your final well, thought. I think the danger at this stage is that anything I say will sound like a stuck record uh, ad infinitum. So I, I will keep this... Uh, 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 um, uh, brief, definitely. Um, you know, I, I I agree with 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 what's been said about this. This, I mean, I both agree with Millie saying that this is a really fundamental point. It could be, but also with Orla that that clearly this is not some sort of grand thinking from first principles trying to make data protection work. It's it seems to me much more scurrying around not necessarily I'm not this isn't to be too disparaging but scurrying around trying to find uh gripes that people have about uh data protection uh particularly from the corporations putting them in a very large document and and that is the proposal which you know I mean it, it, what comes out therefore includes some good stuff it, it, it is a bit unbalanced uh, but it certainly is not uh, groundbreaking stuff from first principles trying to make sense of data protection and you know by god we need it we need it we need to go back to the drawing board in some respects try and come up with a graduated regime which actually makes sense of the dramatically changed nature of computing and digital compared to when these laws were first thought out have have uh, a scheme which yes could be possibly the core data protection principles still applying to a very broad scope of data. But then looking at things like systematization, organization, scale, intrusion, uh, in terms of those further provisions, which um, aren't even being properly implemented in that context, let alone in the context where, frankly, if anyone eyeballed it, they would think, what on earth is going on? Um, coming back to, uh, you know, enforcement, um, I hope that, you know, if, if 
the debate, which is definitely coming in Parliament, can be about sort of recognising that some of these substantive reforms have a point. There could also be um, more of a, 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 a pushback on you know, further entrenching what is already a very mediocre at best record of our regulator actually helping data subjects and helping address their their key concerns. And and that could involve revisiting the Killock um, ruling. Not not obviously it is the ruling now in terms of the law, but, but, but let's change that law and let's have the tribunal provide effective accountability and governance of the ICO because it's that kind of granular, you know, is this... Uh, regulator achieving its uh, objectives in relation to specific concerns that are put to it that is is desperately needed. And I don't think that JI, J, 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 Judicial Review, for, for all sorts of reasons, principally because of the Wednesbury unreasonableness test, is, 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 is quite right. I think we do need something um, discreet. And uh, we, well, some of us thought we had it in the order to progress complaints. We clearly don't. So we should go back to Parliament and and use this process to actually achieve something for the data subject. Thanks. That's, so yes, that's that's my my contribution. Pardon me. Excuse me. No, I think David, that's a fantastic note to end on in terms of emphasising the fact that while oversight is incredibly important and the independent nature of it very much underpins its role and function and operation, it's also hugely important to remember that the effective implementation and enforcement of data protection rights is something that should be considered in in more depth and also in terms of how that could be reformed and strengthened going forward. And I agree with your point regarding a judicial review not being this complete and all-encompassing fail-safe for the complete oversight of all functions of the ICO. It serves a very narrow and limited function in terms of oversight, and that shouldn't replace high-level evaluation that should be taken at a parliamentary level of how the ICO is operating and how effectively it's operating. And that sort of good governance and due diligence that needs to happen over time, that's an impact assessment for the ICO that is far from static and should be dynamic. So maybe that is something that could emerge from this consultation process. We will have to wait and see. But for now, it's my task to give a huge thank you to all of who really have provided us with the most brilliant and rich and insightful interventions today. Thanks so much to Ruben, Millie and Orla for joining us. To give a huge thank you to David for producing a fantastic paper that really has started a very important conversation at a very critical moment for the future of UK data protection law and to thank him for his presentation also today. So thanks so much, David. Thanks to everyone. I hope you all have a good evening and I look forward to seeing you all soon.